Um, I've been asked to give this presentation on confusion. It's quite a daunting task uh, to present a, an approach to confusion. It seems to me a bit like presenting something about how to approach an unwell patient and all the uh, things that you need to see only a bit more complicated. But it is a, it is a topic that's quite dear to me because um, we see it co quite often as neurology registrars and uh, there's a lot to learn about the human uh, brain and the human mind when you approach a confused patient. And it's quite rewarding when you, uh, when you try to treat these, these patients. I have, um, I have implemented some interactive um, elements in the, in the talk. So if you take a minute to um, use the VVOX app uh, in order to be to participate in these uh, um, questions, you can either scan the QR code or use the uh, the link on the top with uh, using the session ID that's underneath. I'm going to give you a few seconds for that. Okay. They will appear also in the question. So if you if you go into vvox.app and then the session ID will appear when the questions pop up as well. Why is it important as a as a presentation? It's a very common one, as I said. You uh, you will see confused patients in pretty much all of the settings, primary and secondary care. Uh, whether you work in medicine, surgery, or ICU, you will always have to deal with uh, confused patients throughout your career. Um, and about half. Half of the elderly patients, for example, that get admitted to hospital, they will have some kind of acute and acute confusion episode. So it's very important to uh, get uh, get to know what confusion is, how it appears, and how to approach it. And it's often very uh, very much associated with um, uh, long longer term problems that arise from it. Uh, and uh, quite often it's associated with high morbidity and mortality, um, and uh, that requires often very prompt and uh, uh, sometimes at time sensitive management as we will see some uh, some of the pathologies that cause uh, confusion will require a very uh, quick um, uh, reflex uh, almost uh, um, decision making and uh, treatment commencement the learning objectives from this talk are to clarify a few uh, terms uh, surrounding confusion and i will give you my uh, um, approach to the uh, to confusion uh, with a systematic way, including so the tools to use uh, history examination, diagnostic testing, and uh, uh, differential of di of uh, confusion. You can see we have some issues with someone not not letting them join. Uh, um, uh, continuing, um, we will go into the etiology of confusion and we'll talk a little bit about the uh, um, management of confusion as, um, uh, as we approach towards the end. So if you, if you log into the session, I'll try to activate the question. It's a bit difficult when we don't do it as Right. You should have the first question. And you should you should now have it on your mobiles as well, or your apps. Uh, so you are the medical FY on on evening duty. This is a very common scenario. A nurse bleeps you uh, because she's concerned as the 74-year-old lady who was admitted three days ago with a chest infection uh, was not interacting with her very appropriately during the medical medication rounds, and she seems confused. So have a look at the... Uh, ways to approach the problem and sorry <clears throat> sorry to interrupt for Jeremos. i don't think the um the question isn't showing on the screen okay you might have to reshare mm. if you just want to present as a kind of on the full sort of powerpoint screen as you normally would um i can always yeah. sort of ask any questions that that's going to make your life easier rather than having to flip between modes. So if you just click to present fully on your screen, that may make things easier. Okay. Is that is that okay? Yeah, then? I can we can see it. We can see it now. Okay. All right. And uh are you able again then to vote for it? Yeah. Polls open. Yeah, it's just it's showing all the little slides on the side as well. So if you want to present fully, then we can just ask questions in the chat on medal. 
Ah, okay. I'm, I am presenting fully. I don't know for what reason, for whatever reason, it's showing as the... Okay. That's the only thing. Perhaps if we skip the... If we finish with the questions, then I'll yeah. go back into reader mode. Yeah, um, that's all right. It just said, Phil's just said it looks like you've shared the PowerPoint mid window, but we can still read it, so... Okay, all right. When uh, you should have some kind of... Um, the all the questions and the answers available on the app itself the vivox app uh, so that would be helpful it's not very compatible i guess uh, but once we get through the questions then uh, i'll go back to read them more then it will be much more visible all right so um let's have a look at what people think Good. So uh, uh, some of you would uh, arrange for some blood tests and review the patient after and chest X-ray and CT head and uh, review the patient after those are performed. Um, some of you would uh, 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 call the patient family to ask what the cognitive baseline is, try to get some more information. Uh, the majority would uh, ask for a, a new set of observations, so sort of a, a basic sort of uh, screen test by the nurse and go to review the patient uh, as soon as possible. None of you would uh, change the patient's antibiotics blindly. I think that's pretty good. And um, uh, you would, uh, some of you would leave the review for the day team as they are a bit more familiar, and you would just help them by getting some investigations uh, going. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about the results towards the end when we when we go through the questions again. Um, let's have a look at the second one. So. A 67-year-old left-handed taxi driver was admitted with an NSTEMI. Uh, the nurse calls you because the patient appeared confused earlier when, she, uh, when he was asked what he would like for dinner. But just about an hour before that, uh, when he was given his medication, he appeared completely normal. You arrive and assess him, and he's following all your instructions. He understands all instructions, but um, when you ask him questions, he responds with some mixed words. He stops halfway. He seems angry and frustrated. Uh, at himself or others, uh, and you think that perhaps his left hand grip is also weaker than the right, which seems to be the dominant hand. Um, his observations show only hypertension and an irregular heart rhythm. What would be your next step? So we have some options. You can call his wife to ask if he had a previous similar symptoms. Uh, would you send off some blood tests or arrange a chest X-ray? Reassurance, uh, arrange an emergency CT head scan, or perform an Underbrook's cognitive examination. This is a, a cognitive screen testing, which uh, we'll get to a bit later on during the presentation. All right, a couple of seconds more. Few more going in. All right, good. Let's have a look. Good. The majority of you would basically arrange an emergency the head scan and urgently involve a senior colleague. I think you're spot on. Uh, I think obviously the concern here is a stroke. Um, let's go to case three. So. A 26-year-old woman with no past medical history is brought to the emergency department after a witness generalized seizure. A family report that she has been acting a bit oddly for the past two weeks, a bit of a strange behavior. They were a bit concerned about drug use due to some reported hallucinations and some paranoid thoughts. Um, we have a few investigations here that you could do, and you might do all of them, uh, but I, I was hoping to ask you what you would think the most helpful test would be in this in this case, which will prompt a little bit discussion later on. I'll give you a few seconds to answer. When I say the, the, uh, the most high yield, I mean the, the one that would probably help more than others in terms of helping out with the diagnosis, the accurate diagnosis. Very good. All right. Let's have a look. Good, interesting. Uh, so more than half of you would choose the toxicology screen. 
Um, some of you would choose blood test, uh, B12 folate, thyroid function, EEG, and a few of you would choose an MRI scan and 0% would choose a lumbar puncture. That's, that's a very interesting result. I've, from my experience, I've rarely seen toxicology screen being used. Um, your experience might be different, but um, I have um, I have rarely seen it happen. Um, and the concern here would be in a young patient uh, with uh, paranoid hallucinations would be, uh, if there wasn't any drug use, obviously, um, it would be for a limbic encephalitis, and that's something that we will encounter during the presentation. And we'll see what the most appropriate test for that is. And the last one for now, uh, 76-year-old man presents with generalized seizure in the emergency department. His wife mentions that for the past a couple of days, he has not been feeling very well, and she thought that he had the flu and was incoherent, confused. He's slightly drowsy, and he's still confused with you. His observations show essentially a high temperature and uh, a few others which are sort of borderline abnormal. The neurological examination is not very easy to perform, but it doesn't show any clear, obvious focal neurology. And his bloods show hyponatremia and a slight increase in the inflammatory markers. His chest x-ray is clear. What would be the next step? What would you do? Again, usually one right answer, but equally all of the answers might be correct in, in the same context. The next step is the question. I'll wait a little bit longer. Okay, maybe we'll hit 20. There we go. Good. Um, good. So that's that's a, that's a healthy sort of uh, answer. Uh, people are uh, choosing different things. So um, a CT head scan, uh, most answers, MRI head scan, lumbar puncture, antimicrobials, or EEG. I, I wouldn't say that any of them is wrong to uh, start and organize um but i'll i'll get to the to the question again once we towards the end about this specific one because it's it's important right let me just okay i hope this is a little bit better now so um trying to um trying to clarify a few confusing sort of terminology issues confusion is a, a presentation it's a symptom in a way it's not a condition in itself it's a very it's an umbrella term that encompasses different uh, uh, behaviors but essentially it's a loss of the the normal goal oriented behavior uh, or actions that we do on a daily life and the cohesive thought processes that underlie that um some people might see confusion as a disruption of the content of consciousness. If we think about consciousness as um, uh, being alert, uh, uh, but also aware of ourselves and the environment, uh, then confusion would fall towards the uh, awareness end of consciousness and the disruption of those processes that um, uh, control that part of consciousness. Um, for the sake of uh, visualizing it, uh, you can see here that this this uh, graph shows uh, in one axis the level of consciousness and the other axis the content of consciousness. We are sort of when we are assessing confusion, we're towards the upper right corner. Um, uh, so the person needs to be sort of alert usually, but they might be drowsy. It's only to show that uh, consciousness, alertness, uh, and confusion um, they are presentations of disruption in, new, in neuronal networks that are very well uh, connected to each other. So that's why often we see confused patients becoming very drowsy um, and uh, sleepy. And uh, I'm making a presentation towards the end of April, which uh, will talk about how to deal with uh, uh, reduced consciousness levels in uh, patients. Delirium is something different. There's a specific uh, terminology in, on DSM-5 uh, in uh, the a psychiatric uh, manual. Um, you can read it, but essentially what it is is, uh, is, a, is a change in uh, cognition, which is usually 
uh, happens, it develops over a very short period of time, so it's an acute confusional episode. The, the, a significant hallmark of that is that it fluctuates throughout the day, uh, and uh, it has to be a new thing and not uh, sort of a progression of a dementia. Um, in all, though, all these terms, delirium, confusion, abnormal behavior, sleepiness, change in mental status, they are in, in daily life, they're used interchangeably by uh, the staff, nurses and other healthcare professionals. And uh, as well, the, among doctors, you will see a lot of variability in the use of the term. So whatever term is being used, whenever you hear any of these terms, really, your approach will need to be the same. So a prompt, careful and systematic way of approaching the problem. So getting on to the approach that I will be suggesting, uh, um, it's, it's an idea of going back to the basics and thinking about what our goals are when we're being asked to assess a, a confused patient. So what I always see as a first goal is to recognize towards the left of the presentation is to recognize the high risk causes of confusion that can be very easily picked up and treated promptly. So I have hypoglycemia as the most common sort of this kind of cause for confusion, which can be picked up only by doing a simple blood test and you can correct it very quickly just by giving some glucose. Um, the same can be with hypo hypoxia, for example, if someone's oxygen is 70%, obviously they'll be confused. So um, get first the very quickly recognizable and easily treatable uh, causes of confusion, and then move on to the second step or the second goal, which is to try to collect as much information as possible to allow an accurate diagnosis. So that will be via the history examination uh, and uh, diagnostic investigations. The set, third step would be always to think about the differentials of confusion. There are confusion mimics. So there are pathologies and presentations that mim can mimic confusion. And it's important to differentiate them and separate them because they will have a different treatment to confusion and a different approach to them. Uh, then think you will, we will need to obviously identify any reversible causes of confusion and treat them. Um, as a, not the immediate ones, but other ones that will require a bit of more workup. And we always need to keep the patient comfortable and safe while we do so. Uh, finally, the, the final goal is to try to get all of the diagnoses that might be contributing towards uh, confusion, uh, make them as accurate as possible to allow a proper prognostication uh, of um, uh, the, uh, the underlying pathology. Our tools are simple, our ABCD, our history examination and diagnostic tests. And usually it can be with in this order, with the ABCD always has to be first, I, that's my approach. Uh, but then history examination, the diagnostic test can run in parallel. I will not go into the ABCD uh, because you know it very well. I think it's, it would be a bit superfluous for this uh, talk. Uh, but we'll head on and start with the history taking. The patient obviously will, in most cases, will be completely unable to provide it, but you will have to make a few attempts in order to try to see if, if you're dealing with a confusion mimic. So if the patient can give you information, then we're not really talking about a confusion patient and we'll have to think a bit harder about it. If the patient cannot provide the history, if they're properly confused, then we check the notes, we check with the nursing staff, the relatives, other healthcare professionals, as much as information as we can get from other people who have seen the patient and what they can describe, uh, we try to get it. When you request the information and when you document, try to document exactly what the behavioral changes are that raise the concern. So don't just say uh, the patient is confused. Uh, that will be a bit difficult for other healthcare professionals to interpret if they have to come back. Just write, you know, the patient re responded this to my question or uh, try to be a bit more descriptive, uh, especially if something doesn't add up. So if uh, you don't have to write all the details, but um, if a question is an answer of the patient or a behavior is particularly uh, worrisome or, or strange to you, then it, it's worth documenting it. And it's always important from the history part of the assessment to establish the onset and the progression of the confusion and to establish the baseline, the cognitive baseline of the patient. The onset of the progression is self-explanatory. When was the patient last seen well or normal or the usual self? Was the change over seconds, minutes, hours, years? Uh, and what? how has this progressed over these seconds, minutes, hours, days or years? This is very important because it hints to different pathologies. So sometimes only from the history you can say if you're dealing with a dementia, 
progression or uh, with a limbic encephalitis, with an infectious encephalitis, only by just asking the, uh, the questions about the onset and the progression. Uh, establishing the cognitive baseline is very important when uh, you're trying to talk to relatives. Sometimes it can go a bit to the background, not in the immediate sort of assessment of the patient might go to the next day if you're doing a night shift and you can't get hold of anyone to give you this uh, information. Um, the way I see it is you can either go with cognitive domains, so ask specific cognitive domains and how the person does and in order to be able to compare with what you have in front of you, or you can ask about daily activities. That's a lot more practical and I think easier for a level of FY1. Daily activities, they can say a lot about our cognitive baseline. We start off with something simple like, uh, is the person, the patient working and what's the profession? And if they can do simple stuff like eating, drinking, toileting, dressing themselves, all the way to sort of more complex things that require a higher cognitive baseline, uh, such as doing the, are they doing their personal finances? Uh, do they use computers? Do they have any high end, high skill, uh, hobbies or uh, uh, professions, so do they play chess, for example, it, this will be important because um, a, a, a person with a poor cognitive baseline who has a little bit of a fluctuation um, and a bit of more confused, a little bit more confused than usual is completely different for someone who's sort of cognitively intact, as we say, and uh, uh, is having uh, a new onset of confusion. But most of the history is really not related to the cognition itself or the confusion itself. So you just have to go through your usual structure of history taking and you have to be detailed and thorough. Uh, you have to check the reason for admission of a patient when you're, an when you're assessing an inpatient and how they've progressed. Have there been any complications, any infections, um, any faults during their stay? This will make a huge difference because you can, you can uh, pick up the diagnosis just by reading a few notes. Uh, you always have to check the medical background, alcohol excess and illicit drug use, uh, or any uh, previous mental health issues which might hint towards overdoses or drug-related confusion. The travel history and unwell contacts as part of the usual structural uh, structure of uh, history taking. Uh, the current drug history and any medication that have been stopped recently or started recently. And finally, especially for elderly patients, the fluid status if they're eating and drinking okay, if they have been opening their bowels all right, and if they have been mobilizing in the past few days while they're in hospital. As we'll see, these are quite important. And we move on, after we've taken all the history, all the information that we can, uh, we move on to the examination of the patient. I usually try to think of it as uh, the examination of the cognition first, the general neurological examination, and a general physical examination. You don't have to do it in a, sp in a particular order, but it's just something that you will just have to have in mind that you need to approach systemically, systematically. So the cognitive examination has a few domains. Um, th this might seem a little bit daunting, but essentially it's things that you do and you will be doing as an F1 all the time when you're assessing a diffuse patient. You can ask them, try to see if they're orientated. You can ask them, this will be during your ABCD anyway, uh, when you do the D letter of the disability. And you can ask them about the name, month, date, year. This will take less than 30 seconds uh, to see if the patient is orientated in time and space. Um, and then from orientation, which I won't go into, it's very self-explanatory, we'll go into attention. Attention is the hallmark of acute confusional changes. So most of the, uh, confusion, acute confusion episodes, uh, they are, uh, they definitely have a, a problem with attention and there's an impairment of attention. Um, you can check it with these tests that I have listed here. You can always go back in the, the on-demand sort of videos and have a look at all the tests that I'm suggesting. But essentially, you can ask them to name the months of the year forwards and backwards. Um, you can ask them to um, uh, repeat uh, some digits that you give them. Normal people can remember um, up to seven digits that you give them. And that's not really memory. It's more um, an attention process. Um, we'll see how memory um, is different from attention, really. Uh, you can ask them to remove uh, seven from 100 and keep doing that uh, as they um, keep doing that uh, one after the other time uh, and see how they get on. And uh, try to spell the word, the, the word world forwards and backwards. 
although the, the two the latter ones are a bit uh, related to the educational level of the patient as well so but the first two they're quite good and they can assess attention very easily and you can write it down and then you will know if the patient cannot say the months of the year backwards if they can say it one day and they can't say it the other day then that shows a change um, then you move on to language examine the language you have to pay extra consideration here because of aphasia which is often confused with simple confusion uh, so you check the comprehension you ask them to do things if they do them properly then they have good comprehension um, how they speak and if their speech is fluent simply by saying by answering some questions you will understand if the words are uh, all good i will skip repetition and reading and writing because you're a bit time limited but one important thing is to do confrontation naming this is essentially holding a pen to them and saying what is this what's this called or a watch or a notebook uh, if they're unable to answer that or they can't say the right words but their attention is uh, intact then that might suggest that they have a language problem uh, a naming problem which might point towards aphasia uh, memory you just ask them about the reason for admission you have a discussion about if they understand where they are and why they are there what has happened what happened yesterday or the day before that um, and any recent current events like pandemics wars what's happening in the outside world uh, president monarchs they assess more remote memory and you can give them three words to begin with when you assess them and ask them within five minutes to uh, repeat it back to you so this is in in contrast to the simple seven digits that you will give them and you will ask them to repeat back to you immediately whereas with memory assessment you will allow them five times to see if their recall is good praxis it might be a little bit above the sort of level of an f1 but essentially it's it just shows how the person might interact it might be a bit above the level of f1 to interpret really rather than to do because it's fairly easy you just ask the patient to uh, wave goodbye blow you a kiss how they brush their teeth um, by holding a toothbrush or uh, comb the hair by holding a, uh, a hairbrush you will see that patients who are apraxic which is usually uh, an impairment of the frontal lobes um, you will um, you will see that they will uh, instead of holding a toothbrush they will use their finger uh, as being uh, a toothbrush itself or they will comb the hair by just running their fingers through the hair instead of showing how they would this is called idiomotor apraxia and it's good because you can document it and it will it will make a difference if further sort of specialist input is required for me it will make a, a huge difference to see that uh, i know that the person has assessed their patient appropriately um you can all of these tests that we uh, talked about the cognitive assessment the cos cognitive examination you can just use a tool like this so the confusion assessment method the cam uh, is has very high sensitivity and specificity it's um, um it's very useful you can if you if you forget sort of the structure that i suggested here you can just use the cam method you can uh, write the score and that can be easily reproducible and you'll be able to compare it from day to day uh, the mini mental test uh, has been found to be the least accurate in studies that have been done so i would still prefer the cam method if you google it it's very fairly simple it's basically what we what i have been discussing about but in a more sort of structured way and the adam brooks takes time you don't have to do it uh it's just something to know about it's a more in-depth uh, assessment of cognitive um, domains uh, in a patient after you have examined them cognitively i would suggest to go on to a general neurological examination it needs to be a top to bottom i have a qr code here for whoever's using the mobile you can uh, check neuropaces the solomon method um on youtube there equally there are five minute um neurology neurology examinations i would urge you to just have a look at them you can do a, a neurological screening examination within five minutes uh, or even less than that um uh, and get a lot of helpful information the, the helpful information and the and the consideration the careful considerations you need to have is to check for visual and sensory neglect you move both hands if the person is not paying attention to the left usually the left side of the world and even though they they're able to see you but they're not paying any attention to it 
Um, so only solely focusing on one side of the world, then that's uh, visual neglect. It signifies a, a structural lesion in the brain, usually a stroke, usually in the in the non-dominant uh, um, hemisphere. Uh, check for meningism. That's really health important for a confused patient, especially if they have any signs of uh, infection um, or high fever. Check for focal neurological deficits. That will signify that there might be a structural lesion in the brain which needs scanning. And check for asterixis. Asterixis, you know it. You use your hands, you uh, extend your elbows and you bring your, your wrists back. And if you have any negative myoclonus on both sides, usually signifies encephalopathy, mostly associated with hepatic encephalopathy, but it can be pretty much all other encephalopathies. And then you go into general physical examination. You check the observations. You need to check for any acute medical issues. It's often that we neurologists being called to see patients, we often skip it as well. But imagine if someone has an acute abdomen and we're looking at, you know, limbic encephalitis. It's it's no good. So it, it, you will be um, sort of well equipped to when you assess a patient to just have no bias and just go there, assess them physically check for any acute medical or surgical pathology, any pulmonary edema, any acute abdomen, any severe cardiac disease that's happening. Check for skin changes, um, non-blanching uh, rash for meningitis, cellulitis as an infection source, or I think that's that should be enough. Um, the, and always think about hidden infection. So infective endocarditis, discitis, and scrotal infection are very often missed, very often missed in patients become septic and we never know what, what's going on because we didn't assess them properly. Uh, and after you do your, your examination and throughout the examination and the history, this is the list that I use to think about things that are, look like confusion but might not be confusion. So I always think about, I need to rule these out in order to make accurate diagnosis. Does the patient have aphasia? Aphasia is an acquired, essentially, impairment of language. It might be either... Uh, problems with understanding language or producing language, as we explained in the in in one of the uh, examples, you will hear the patient jumble the words. All the other cognitive domains will be usually normal, so they will be attentive, but they if they have expressive aphasia production problems, they will jumble the words. They will say, uh, "I went yesterday to uh, house." this kind of way so they, they will they will have problems with producing language and that's uh and that's that usually it will be isolated if there isn't any focal other neurology uh, understanding language problems uh, the receptive aphasia might be a bit more difficult to differentiate uh, if you have to have a very high index of suspicion uh, thankfully some you, most of the times you will find also focal neurology on examination focal neurological deficit because of a stroke hemi neglect we talked about transit global amnesia this is uh, something that is um, is a benign condition uh, most of the times, and it comes. It's usually we say it's monophasic, so it comes once in your life, it doesn't come again. We don't quite know what's the cause of it, but the hallmark of it is the constant, repetitive questioning of where am I, what happened. The people cannot register any new memories. It usually comes, stays for a few hours, and then goes away, and the person may or may not have. Um, memory of what happened, usually they don't. Um, psychosis is another differential. You usually have mental health background there. If you don't have that, then you should have a high suspicion for an organic pathology, as the psychiatrists say, so um, not a psychiatric condition. Charles Bonnet syndrome is a problem with vision. Uh, people might appear confused because they don't see and they have hallucinations, but a brief conversation with them will show you that they actually know that they have hallucinations. And they may or may not be affected by it, uh, but they are not confused. They know where they are. They just see things that uh, do not exist there. And that's because their eyes and their brain um, miscommunicate, essentially. There's defer deferentiation uh, of the occipital, of the visual cortex. Anton syndrome is um, a syndrome of bilateral. Um, it's cortical blindness, it's called. So you have bilateral occipital lobe infarcts, the visual cortex goes completely 
but still the, the person thinks that they can see, but they cannot really see. So they are blind, but they cannot see. It's a bit daunting. It's a bit difficult. If you see someone who th thinks that they see something in front of them or they uh, sort of confabulate and speak about things that are not really there in front of them, it might be a bit difficult and you might think that they might hallucinate. But you can always involve seniors and you can always ask for specialist input. It's just something to have in mind. Sundowning is a diagnosis of exclusion. It's related with uh dementia patients in the evenings they get a little bit more drowsy or they might get a little bit more confused we don't really know what the mechanism of that is but we can only arrive to that conclusion after we have ruled out all the other uh investigation or at least with history examination or the diagnostic test we have ruled out other causes diagnostic testing uh usually uh will include all these tests or well, some of them, obviously, uh, blood tests, chest X-ray, ECG, and other imaging of the affected limbs or areas in the body, a non-contrast CT head scan, MRI head, EEG, lumbar puncture. As you see, we move usually, I suggest moving from the least invasive and uh, least resource, resource demanding, so easier to get, uh, towards the more invasive and uh, more demanding on resources. Obviously, this might vary depending on what the clinical suspicion is. But if you move from the left end towards the right end here on this presentation, if you have if you just need a systematic approach, you're going to get most things in an appropriate manner. This, this is a list of the blood tests that you would need to think about. Um, I would um, uh, I would urge you to have a look at the assessment of the confused patient or the demented, the, the suspicion of dementia, uh, nice CKS, uh, the pathways, because they suggest all these tests essentially for everyone who presents with confusion before we name that, before we suggest that they have dementia. So a full blood count to see if they have infection or anemia. CRP for infection, urea and electrolytes if they have uremia uh, or they have an electrolyte abnormality such as hyponatremia usually or hypercalcemia. The glucose levels, if they have hypo or hyperglycemia, uh, they can be confused. Liver function tests for hepatic encephalopathy. Ammonia as well, if you are suspective, hepatic encephalopathy is very helpful. Uh, vitamin B12 and folate, very easy to get and a good screening test. Um, ABG to check for hypoxia or hypercarbia. Thyroid function tests, again, very easy to get, very often confused. I have had cases, and my colleagues have cases, have had cases where they presented with strange neurological signs that made us think that they might have something in their brain, like a primary uh, intracranial problem, and they ended up just having a, high, um, uh, a dysfunction of the thyroid. Um, and with just treatment, uh, appropriate treatment, they just uh, that re just resolve simply. It's simple test, easy to do. Your analysis, don't do it if the patient is asymptomatic, but do do it if the patient has symptoms. And confusion usually is one of the symptoms. They might not, uh, especially the elderly, might not complain of uh, urinary problems. HIV and syphilis, if suspected, we do use it for screening but not as a first line screening. It's something to keep in mind. Toxicology screen, again, as I said, I don't see it very often. Um, paracetamol, salicylate, and ethanol levels, yes. The others, a bit difficult to get, get to get, and um, for them to be accurately. I don't know what the availability in the lab tests is uh, in the UK either. And blood cultures, again, easy to do if required. I will not explain the other ones. We'll move on to etiological um, the uh, etiological diagnostics uh, of confusion so the seven categories to remember we'll see how the diagnostic tests fit in and also in the next slides that I have prepared so um, I usually think of seven big categories and then try to work out if uh, if it's either of these categories what kind in the category there is huge list I'm afraid um, I don't think that there's any um, sort of benefit in going into detail with all of them. But essentially, you can have toxic and metabolic encephalopathies. They are the most common cause of confusion, uh, especially in admitted patients. Um, simple infections uh, and pyrexia, 
especially in the elderly, will lead to confusion. Treat the, uh, you focus on treatment of uh, the non-CNS infection. Uremia electrolyte imbalance, as I mentioned, glucose imbalance, blood gases imbalance, thyroid and vitamin B12 deficiency. Uh, other uh, vitamin deficiencies as well, as we'll see next with the ethanol-related uh, encephalopathies, uh, can, are possible. There are myriads of toxins that can cause confusion. I would say you keep in mind the common prescribed medication that can cause confusion, opioids, benzodiazepines, sleeping aids, and anticonvulsants. Antidepressants as well might do that. Especially the opioids are very often used for perioperative, for all of those surgical F1s, perioperative situations. They can, they can always uh, cause confusion. Keep that in mind. Um, drugs of abuse. The common ones are ecstasy, ketamine, cocaine, heroin, and hallucinogens. Um, but, uh, have a, a small sort of region in your brain uh, just for ca carbon monoxide poisoning. I have never seen it, but it might happen and you don't want to miss it because um, it's, it's often deadly, but also really treatable usually. Uh, in the elderly, always think about things that we do in our daily lives and how if they get disrupted in an elderly pe person, that can make them confused. I have very often seen people be very confused just because they were de elderly people, uh, people with fragile brains, um, just because they were dehydrated or constipated even, or if they're in, in pain. Um, so you, you, you manage, you manage the, these simple things, they get better. Ethanol or hepatic encephalopathy is also metabolic encephalopathy. It's just, it's, it's a bit more, uh, it's, it's important, that's why I mentioned it separately. Delirium tremens happens after uh, sudden cessation of alcohol. You might, it might be associated with seizures and autonomic dysfunction. Uh, you just treat it symptomatically. They might need ICU even, uh, and they might need anti-epileptic medication for the seizures. Vernicase encephalopathy, B1 deficiency. Whoever has even a slightest sort of history of alcohol excess and they come to hospital confused, I will always think about Pabrinex. I, there's no harm in giving them Pabrinex. I have never seen anything, any adverse effect of it. And um, you don't want to leave people with Vernicase and Kephalopathy untreated because it, it can be devastating uh, and they can develop Corsacops, etc. Hepatic encephalopathy, a bit more complex. You will have a lot of liver disease um, evidence in your hand. Um, uh, treatment is usually, you will know much better than me, but treatment is usually uh, laxatives um, in order to get the excess ammonia uh, out of the body. Spinal fluid pyocytosis, this is another big category. This will include all the infectious meningitis, encephalitis, and all the different kinds of uh, um, microbes that cause that. Neoplastic meningitis as well, autoimmune limbic encephalitis uh, is a new, um, uh, it's, not, it's not very new, but it's a recent sort of discovery of uh, people who develop psychosis, abnormal behavior, seizures, confusions, um, and they often they, uh, get treated as uh, uh, new onset uh, psychiatric disorders, uh, but they are usually due to uh, they usually do, do an inflammatory process in the brain uh, you can see it with an mri scan um, you can see uh, if you if you rule out the infection then you treat them with uh, steroids and immunosuppressants most of the times well not all most of the times but many times they're associated with uh, uh, neoplasm so as paraneoplastic syndromes but sometimes they can be uh, on their own autoimmune conditions Drug-induced meningitis, there are three drugs that uh, you should sort of remember. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, you can get drug-induced meningitis, cotrimoxazole, and immunoglobulins, IVIG. Um, just to keep that in mind, all these conditions will require, essentially, one way or the other, will require a lumbar puncture. So if you have an infectious uh, meningitis, you will see someone with fevers, seizures, confusion, Anyone who comes in with confusion and a fever, uh, or a seizure and a fever, uh, more so, a seizure and a fever, always think about uh, infectious encephalitis. Um, 
and it's particularly important to treat them with a cyclovir early on uh, because it's devastating it, can, it the, the mortality is very high if you don't treat them and then you can always very quickly arrange for a brain scan and a lumbar puncture and rule that out non-convulsive status epilepticus so that's an entity that we often see um not that often but more often than other specialties i guess um, it's very difficult to descend from uh, metabolic encephalopathies. Uh, you need to have a high index of suspicion. If someone comes in with no epilepsy, they have a seizure, there's prolonged difficulty coming around from the seizure, talking about hours, half a day rather than a few, just a couple of hours or, um, or slightly more than that. Then, um, or there is an unexplained confusion that you have investigated, otherwise you can't find the cause. Think about non-convulsive status epilepticus. Essentially, it's ongoing seizure activity that doesn't manifest as motro seizures or other sort of clinically obvious seizures, and it can just be causing the patient confusion. So they're just not able to uh, um, have normal thought processes just because of the abnormal um, uh, brain function, but they will not manifest differently. You do an EEG, you can see if there's non-convulsive status epilepticus. Structural brain lesions, that's a bit self-explanatory. If you see focal neurological deficits, very high index of suspicion to do neuroimaging, tumors, abscesses, bleeds, strokes. Uh, strokes are a bit uncommon to cause confusion, but there are uh, situations where you might have isolated confusion, um, usually when there is some background of cognitive impairment anyway. Uh, Practically most patients with uh, new onset confusion will have eventually a non contrast CT head scan unless you have a very clear other cause causing the confusion. Uh, and it's a simple scan to get nowadays, very simple. You just get it done, get it out of the way. You don't, you don't miss subdural hematomas, which might present with confusion. You don't make mistakes like that and you roll it out with a simple scan. Uh, and the MRI scans are much better for low grade gliomas, thalamic infarcts, and for something else which is called press this is a cause for confusion which you might not be very familiar with um it might be a little bit uh unnecessary for you to learn that now but essentially the it's it's a syndrome of vasogenic edema uh, it's re it's related to very high uh, blood pressure um sometimes it's in the in the spectrum of um, um hypertensive encephalopathy and uh, uh, this is what usually causes seizures also in uh, eclampsia, uh, women with eclampsia. MRI scan is required for that. If you have arrived to the point where you have someone with confusion uh, and seizures, for example, CT scan doesn't show anything, all the other tests don't show anything, you will eventually need an MRI scan. So that's my advice. So you will need better imaging of the brain if you think that there is something ongoing in the brain causing the confusion. If the CT scan doesn't show it, go for an MRI scan. A neuroleptic malignant syndrome is something that happens in people who the hallmark of it is rigidity and hypothermia and autonomic problems but also people get confused it's people who get started on antipsychotics if you have taken a proper drug history even if it doesn't come to your mind now it will because it's in your systemic approach if you have taken a proper history while working in this chain of uh, investigations of uh, for for your patient you will have offered someone else the idea of uh, neuroleptic malignant syndrome being a possibility. But you will see this patient, they're very rigid. Your, the neurological examination is completely abnormal. You will most likely will immediately ask for senior input. So you can see that we started from a lot of very basic things to quite advanced things. Uh, some important things to remember is that Obviously, not every confused patient will need an MRI, EG, and LP. I don't mean that with the systemic approach. So use the cost-effective approach. This is also the, the, the approach of least harm to the patient. Uh, LPs don't come without their problems. Um, and uh, even a prolonged stay in hospital because of a, a not good approach to the investigations will eventually prove harmful for the patient if we keep them in have all the tests that they are not necessary. Uh, be always wary of multiple causes of confusion. So a patient with a seizure may have aspirated and have a development of pneumonia. Someone with a low B12 doesn't necessarily have confusion because of a low B12. Always have an open mind. If you're not convinced that the 
cause that you have found initially is the main cause of the confusion or all the causes of the confusion, then keep investigating. So we went, as we said, I think we hit all our goals. Uh, with the ABCD, we recognized the high risk ones and we fixed them. We collected a lot of information. We ruled out the confusion mimics. We treated the, the reversible causes always because a lot of these conditions are a bit complex, always get senior input as to what the appropriate treatment is. Um, and we provide, we tried with all this to provide an accurate diagnosis. Now, these are all the differentials that I have mentioned. So the, these are quite daunting, quite, quite a lot. But I just wanted with a few quick slides to show you that how we move from with a systemic approach that we've I've suggested, we can move from all these differentials to basically zero differentials. So we're clearing out all the all the uh, causes for confusion one by one or a few by few. So by doing our ABCD, we remove uh, the glucose differential and the blood gases, the hypothermia, hypothermia, and the pain. We have already recognized it. We treat it. It goes off the differential list. With a bit of history, we additionally remove transient global amnesia, the, the, the medication-related and toxin-related poisoning, uh, constipation, urinary retention. If we ask about this question, we'll have the answers. Ethanol, ethanol and hepatic encephalopathy. If the patient doesn't drink, it's off the list. Drug-induced meningitis. You will see what kind of medication the patient is. We take the cognitive assessment. We do the cognitive assessment. We remove aphasia. We remove psychosis, Charles Bonnet syndrome. We do a general neurological examination. We also remove hemineglect. We remove Anton syndrome, neuroleptic malignant syndrome. And we also, uh, all the other, uh, the ones that I have marked in yellow, we get a, a very good uh, sort of idea whether it's one of those. We cannot essentially completely clear them, but we can sort of clinically say whether they're not or whether they're possible or not, probable or not. Similarly, with a general physical examination, we remove dehydration as well and we investigate for the pyrexias. We do our simple tests and we check, we find an infection, we remove it from the list. We check for uremia, thyroid dysfunction, vitamin B12 uh, deficiency with the simple tests that we've done. We remove those from the equation. We do a CT head and we know if the patient has a tumor, abscesses or bleeds. We remove that from the equation if they don't. We do an MRI head scan. Additionally, we know if they have press, we know if they have ischemic stroke with a lot more sensitivity than the CT head scan. And then we do an EEG and we know that if they have non-convulsive status. And finally, with a lumbar puncture, we can find, confirm if they have an infectious neoplastic or autoimmune limbic encephalitis. This is obviously sim simplified. There's obviously a lot of gray areas, but we don't need to go into that. You have a lot of differentials here. If you follow this sort of systemic, systematic approach and you're careful, you are over the patient and you listen to them you you keep your eyes open and uh, uh, you 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 stay on a, uh, with an open mind and a systemic a systematic approach then you will probably be in a much better place than someone who just does a few random investigations as we said these things can run in parallel be aware beware of over investigation do i need a lumbar puncture before i conclude that a patient has sun downing you don't really need that if they don't have any clinical suggestion that they require a lumbar puncture, you don't necessarily do it. Um, and you always, though, be aware of the under investigation. As we said, a lot of things can run together. So a patient with who is confused with hyponatremia, they might be confused because of the hyponatremia, but perhaps you need to think about whether they have SGI autoimmune encephalitis. There will be other things in the history, the examination that will hint towards it. Don't worry. Treatment. It's just a simple slide. Treat the cause, you will treat the confusion. Always keep the patient safe and comfortable while you do so. You don't want the patients uh, confused running on the wards and falling and hitting their heads. Um, get carers to uh, on one-to-one, -one, uh, get family involved, not nowadays with COVID, but usually yes. Better lightning, have them uh, visible uh, with, with the nurses. But usually there are pathways in each trust that allows for that. And you can also try pharmacological sedation if need be. Always, you know, don't do that first, essentially. So I think we're running a bit um, sort of uh, out of time. But essentially, I will just comment on that, um, comment on these questions. 
the first question most of you i remember asked for a set of observation review the patient in the first instance that was the uh, case where um, you were just asked to see someone because they were confused i think that's a pro probably the right thing to do as we saw in the um, if you have a systematic approach the systematic approach dictates that you really need to find out what the patient has and often you know it might make the, a huge difference if you assess them first thing in the night rather than next thing in the morning by the team because it might even save their life if they have an acute stroke and you have diagnosed it there and then because someone thought it was confusion but you thought it was aphasia and some and they get thrombolized and you will have you, you know you have saved the language i mean it's a, it's a huge thing the second case uh, uh, was with the uh, NSTEMI. I think here you you uh, smashed it. Yes, an emergency CD head scan. It was the gentleman who had aphasia, essentially, uh, the scenario that I just said. Um, this one, I mean, you were all right. As I said, I'm just a bit skeptical about toxicology screens. You know, they might, it's it's a bit looking at like something in a haystack. Maybe in America it's different. They All the American textbooks keep saying toxicology screen. I've never really seen it. In this case, I was a bit more worried about autoimmune encephalitis. An MRI scan will most likely give us the solution, the, the uh, uh, answer to that. And if we need to, we do a lumbar puncture and we send for autoimmune antibodies and we uh, investigate further to, as to what kind of limbic encephalitis that is. But that, that's for something for the neurologist to do. Uh, and the last case, that's a very interesting one. So essentially, this gentleman has fever, seizure, confusion. So my concern here is that this man has infectious encephalitis. Okay, you always need to have that in mind. They might have another infection, but um, if they are a bit, if they had a bit of a flu, they have a seizure. Um, state of the person who stopped dopamine agonist abruptly. Yep, we'll go to the questions. I'm just finishing up here. These are the take-home messages for you. Uh, sorry, this one, uh, before I go to your questions. Um, so the, uh, in this case, if we have um, a gentleman with this, I would probably just give them antimicrobials first, then get an urgent CT head scan within an hour, um, depending on examination findings, and then do a lumbar puncture. Uh, and try to do it as quickly as I can in order to not uh, um, uh, have the results being um, uh, influenced by the by the antimicrobials that I'm giving. So the take-home message for you, confusion is a presentation, not a condition, as we said. If you have a systematic prompt and detailed inquiry, you increase the chances of better survival for your patient. Uh, diagnosis is not an instant. You will most likely be part of a diagnostic chain. It might take days for the to, to reach the diagnosis. Uh, so do your do your best to be the strongest link in the chain, and be aware of the risk of over and under investigation. While you always investigate, which will take maybe take days, always keep in mind that we need to keep the patient safe um, uh, while you investigate for the causes. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'll just give you the qr code for the feedback and certificate link also if you scroll up the questions the chat you will be able to find the feedback and uh, the feedback link and get your certificate and i will try to answer questions i would like to know a little so makota marina uh, is the first question uh, i would like to know a little bit more about neuro state of a person who stopped dopamine agonist abruptly yeah so uh, this was in the neuroleptic malignant syndrome uh, essentially, a person who takes dopamine agonists, if you stop them abruptly, it's kind of like the same as giving them dopamine uh, antagonists. So the, a lot of the antipsychotics have dopamine antagonism. So if you do that, then it's very antagonism. So if it's, you do that, then it's um, very. Get a little bit of feedback on the. Um, sorry. Uh, on my voice. But essentially, if you do that, then there's a high chance of developing neuroleptic malignant syndrome where you get dysautonomia, you get change in, uh, you get impairment of your autonomic nervous system, you might get fluctuations in your uh, blood pressure, uh, flushing, you get uh, hypothermia, they become very uh, hot, uh, and you get confusion and, and rigidity. So they become very rigid. These people with neuroleptic malignant syndrome, uh, you need to, many times you need to involve ICU, you need to keep them safe in terms of their autonomic 
dysfunction and you might need to give them some medication and usually it's dantrolene uh, which is uh, um, something to uh, like a muscle relaxant and uh, you give them bromocryptin which is an antagonist um, if this if they are, were on antagonists and they on uh, sorry on uh, dopamine agonists and they were stopped abruptly obviously you just give them the dopamine agonists and usually that might re reverse the, the problem I hope that answered the question. Um, is there any tips on performing a neuro exam on a confused patient? Yes, that was very good. Um, I really wanted to talk a little bit more about that. Um, so the important things, you will see a lot of overlap with uh, the presentation that I'll do uh, on the comatose patient. Essentially, uh, I would say, so trying to do a top to bottom examination, you may not be able to get them to uh, uh, do visual fields. So instead of visual fields with uh, moving your hands up and down, you can do blink to threat. So you try to move your hand in front of the uh, eyes and you see if they blink. So that's your visual fields. Eye movements, you might get them to just see if, the, if they can track your your face. Usually people stare, at, stare in your eyes, even if they're confused. You, so they might not be able to follow your finger. So you might just want to move around and you will see if they track your uh, your eyes or your face as you move around and that will give you an idea of how the eyes move um, you can see the if they're grimacing and if there's any asymmetry to that uh, if as a response to pain for example if they're grimacing and there's symmetry in both sides then that gives you a bit of a facial expression um, weak weakness wise Power-wise, it's a bit difficult to assess, but essentially what you'll try to do is, for example, if the patient is agitated, you will try to uh, get them to push you away, uh, not trying to put them in harm, but see if they have the strength in both sides to push you away if they if they get agitated. Obviously, don't you know stay clear of any punches or slaps, but um, uh, other things that you might want to do is uh, uh, how they respond to... Um, uh, pain stimuli so if you uh, if you do pain stimuli on one side and they retract completely but on the other side they just they just have no response and that might in indicate a difference between left and right which might indicate a problem for example a stroke which might have affected the pathways uh, of sensation and motor uh, responses there are other things that you see in patients who get as they become more comatose but i think more on that uh, when we assess that you can always do the reflexes uh, that, uh, you know, they, that's quite easy to do. And you can always do a plantar response, you know, to see if there's any difference. So an upgoing plantar, a Babinski, with sort of signs of weakness might suggest that there is, uh, for example, um, a stroke or a, a structural lesion that's causing a problem within the um, uh, corticospinal tracts. Um, I think that comes to mind very easily. You can see if they, you know, if they drink the water and they don't cough, um, uh, the, the swallow is okay. For example, it's just trying to get as much information as you can, really, just by you know being over them and always document. I mean, I find it very important that you document, um, you know, patient move their arm or you know, just in simple words. I mean, it would be very helpful for me to just read that rather than, you know, difficult to assess. I don't know if any other questions. Uh, uh, share the link. Yeah, the, the link was shared. Any other questions? Anyone have any other questions? I'm sorry because the, there's a lot of differentials in the um, in this whole pro presentation, but um, I couldn't help it. Um, thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, I hope that you find that helpful. Uh, All right, it looks like uh, we've come towards the end of the questions. Yeah, it? shall we call it then? Yeah, I think. <clears throat> Thank you so much for joining us. That was really, really helpful. Um, Great. Certainly, Thank yes. Cool. I've been Thanks on carry the other this, We're a bit above, you know, yeah, we're a few minutes. Um, That's all right. Hopefully, it wasn't too long. <laughs> <laughs> Having been on care of the elderly for four months, the um, the differentials normally sort of set in stone, really. But it's definitely helpful to know the wider. 
Yeah, yeah, I've, um, yeah. I mean, as we said, you know, metabolic top, metabolic encephalopathies are, you know, usually the case. Yeah. But, um, it's good. Like I've seen, I've seen a lot of elderly with the uh, infectious encephalitis, which uh, is it's good to have that in mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. All right. Well, thank you very much. We it doesn't yeah. there's no more questions, so we will call it. If we, I don't know who has control of the broadcasting, but if we stop now should hopefully go off.